Okay, now the next talk is John Dingley to tell us about a decade of making uh, self -ri self stabilizing ride on robots. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is John Dingley. I've never been to the EMF camp before, but I'll definitely come next year. There are a few friends I recognize from um, various um, make affairs over the years. Um, I have to give you a spoiler alert. Um, I'm not an engineer, hardware or software, but my hobbies drift very much into that area. And um, as I've learned things over the years, it has actually helped me with my job. I'm actually what the Americans would call an anesthesiologist. So in medical terms, that means I'm a gas man. So I found this video back in 2008 when I was starting this hobby. And uh, this was a guy in America who's now a Microsoft software engineer. He was trying to build a self-balancing skateboard. And uh, he summed up the pains of this experience quite succinctly here. So I'll just play this short clip. Riding this device is like being on an episode of Jackass. You're bound to get hurt. It's bound to be funny. But it's bound to be painful. Yeah. And I can attest to all those things. So why did I start this hobby? It's something crazy. Well, if you look at things like popular mechanics right back to the 1940s, they're all these wonderful devices with one wheel, tanks, motorbikes, with heroic people doing heroic things on them. And um, in fact, in 2001, in a German university, um, they'd obviously got hold of some sort of uh, early gyro solid state digital gyro unit and they built this unicycle which had a go-kart tire which is extremely wide which balanced itself rather in the same way as a, a segway which actually came later um, i then found a video from norfolk of all places this is a guy who built a skateboard called ben smither he was a lotus software engineer as it turns out and um, they are the main tech employer in norfolk after all and he put this brilliant video up on youtube go for it inspired me so as you can see it balances beautifully <laughs> now this was before Segways are really well known, and it was certainly before all these devices from China. So back in the day, this was quite a phenomenal thing to see. And it, it really inspired me to, to, to build something like this. Um, I was wanting to advance my electronics from my sort of schoolboy experiences and um, get into microcontroller programming. So, so I thought, I'll build one of these. How hard can it be? Well, actually, it is quite hard. Um, so what do I need? I need a motor. That's OK. That's OK. I understand that. Some sort of power controller. Um, that needs to be controlled by a computer. How does a computer control the power controller? Don't know. Have to read up on that. But we've got the internet. It was going OK in 2007. So you need these sensors called accelerometers and gyros. Um, what do they do? Um, how do you use them? Not sure, but I, I know I need them. So right, OK. Have to look into that read up on that how do you use the data what maths do you do on the data from these sensors to tell the motor how fast to go to stop you falling over don't know but we have to look at that as well so a lot of reading required here what software what code what coding language do i need i write that on my laptop i know that and i transfer it to some sort of little computer in the board in the like um Microcontroller, I know that. How do I get it from my laptop to the microcontroller? Don't know, Might have to read that up. So that's where we were. Anyway, I knew how to code, because I'd done that when I was 14, because I built myself one of these fabulous Sinclair computers. Now, many of you are too young to remember this, but this was phenomenal. You could actually build a programmable computer attached to your TV that did things for hardly any money, uh, bearing in mind the school computer at the time was from the university. Um, second hand that it filled the whole room so this was amazing stuff so well here's the microcontroller i got arduino boards hadn't come out yet it looks a bit like a kind of proto arduino it was from active robots it came with almost no documentation so i knew you programmed it in c i know it had inputs from sensors and outputs that you could use to control things and a big sort of socket here, which you somehow plugged it, your laptop to, to load the software onto it. So I thought, right, we've got the brain, so now I need to know how to program in C. 
Right. Well, I only I know some basic, so I thought, well, C must be sort of similar to basic, surely. So I downloaded the whole book of C and printed it out as a PDF, which turned out to be about that thick, like a dictionary of C. So I started studying that. Um, and I thought, well, I've got to write this program. What do I write it on? What environment do I use? So, you know, the internet's come on a bit since then. I mean, it wasn't that obvious how you did these things, but I knew that the manufacturer of the chip had a programming environment called AVR Studio, which is this thing here, that you could write your program in and save it onto your hard drive. Great. How do you get the program from your laptop onto the microcontroller? Again, you guys. To you guys, that's like dead simple. But if you searched that at the time on the web, it wasn't clear. It was sort of assumed you knew. So, uh, right. So, had about a week of surfing the web, I found this odd program called PonyProg, which would allow you to plug a parallel port lead in one end and the other end of the cable into the board, and you could get your program onto the microcontroller, so we can program the brain of our machine. Great, so we're making progress. That's about a month of work there to get to that point. Now, I was helped, my life was saved by this guy, Shane Colton, he's a lecturer at MIT, aren't, aren't these guys always at MIT, it would seem? Um, he ran a course on getting his mechatronic students to build segways, so how do you use the data from an accelerometer and a gyro in some sort of useful way to control something like a Segway. And he actually explained it in reasonably simple terms and reasonably simple maths that I could understand. So, why do you need a gyro? Why do you need an accelerometer? Um, a gyroscope used to be a thing. I'll just show you how technology has advanced. This is a Vulcan bomber gyroscope unit for the autopilot. Okay, so. I've got a friend who's into retro aircraft. Um, goodness knows how many millions of pounds we used to develop that. Um, and that's the modern equivalent from Spark Fun. It's about $10, $10, and it's actually better. So that just shows you where things are. Back in 2007, things weren't to $10. They were a bit more than that. The gyro I used was this one from Silicon Sensing Systems. It's actually still available because it's used in segways the older ones, and it's $263, which is about what I paid for it. So um, it's a bit like these cyclists, you know, when your wife asks you what she, how much did your bike cost, you always divide it by two. So um, I didn't tell her it was that much. And I also ordered an accelerometer because you need both sensors. And unfortunately, it didn't arrive on a little board like that. It arrived as you see in the picture, the size of a pinhead with no visible wire sticking out of it. Now, when I had last done electronics, things came with wires sticking out that you could solder to. So I thought, ah, great. So I actually, after great struggles, managed to solder tiny wires using a magnifying lens to the surface mount tabs on this little rectangle of nothing, black dot. Um, nowadays, they will come like this on a little board with labeled terminals. So, we've got a gyro, we've got an accelerometer. What do these do? Um, you power them up with 5 volts, and these older ones will just put out an analog voltage proportional to movement. So, for an accelerometer, you can use it to see how far you are tilted over from the vertical axis, which is gravity straight down towards the center of the Earth. The gyro will measure how fast you're falling over. So if you're on a, say, a unicycle, how fast you're falling over on your face, it will actually measure that in degrees per second. And you actually use the information from both, which I'll come to in a minute. So here we are. We've got a kind of test rig where I'm wiggling a wooden board around with my sensors on it. And look, we've even got data coming out. We've got an accelerometer reading and a gyro reading and I actually managed to fuse this data together and get something that was about ready to test. And so we have a lovely laser cut chassis. We've got a go-kart wheel in the center. I was going to build a skateboard and I built the world's biggest, chunkiest, heaviest, lead acid battery filled skateboard you see bottom right. And it actually balanced, there it is. So 2008, after about three months of work, um, we've got this thing that balances badly and is 
skateboard-esque. You steer it, by the way, by having the tire a little bit soft and you just lean it one side or the other, rather like carving with a snowboard. And much hilarity ensued on the internet when I put up the variant with the Hot Wheel name on it. Um, I didn't get sued by Mattel. So then I thought, well, let's make something with two wheels in the middle, again like a skateboard, and let's see if we can do it a bit more cheaply, because some cheaper gyros had started to come on the market that weren't 260 odd dollars, they were a lot less than that, so that people could build. So I built this sort of test platform. As you can see, the bracketry is from B&Q, the deck is a piece of wood, there's two cheap lead acid batteries, the wheels are actually the rear wheels from children's Razor scooters, cheap Chinese electric motor, chain drive, and a, a, a sort of polyurethane tyre. So they probably wondered why their spares department was suddenly being hit for requests for rear drive units once I put this on the web. Um, so I did put this on the web as a kind of easy build-ish, self-balancing skateboard way back, so long before these children's hoverboards came out in 2015 um, and everyone's just sick of the sight of the things, this was quite unusual. And um, as you see, I put it on Instructables and got a lot of views. And it's sad to say, all the emails I get are either from Germany or from the US. None from the UK. Though in the entire time I've been doing this, maybe just one or two from the UK, which I think is a bit sad, but there we are. So here's something, I, we're in the middle of the journey now, we've got something that works, it's reasonably small, there's a carrying handle on the side. What have we learned? Um, we've got the battery on the top. Um, at one end I have some caster wheels because I found that if you stop or the machine goes wrong, the front end digs in to the ground and flips you off. So it's best to have wheels on the front, little ones, so you roll to a stop gracefully which is less embarrassing. Also, you need some sort of hand controller which has to have at least one button in it, and that's the dead man button. That means if you fall off, the machine doesn't keep traveling along and smack you in the head when you're already lying on the ground bleeding. It just makes your day even worse. So if you let go of the button, it cuts the power. You can have other things as well. For example, it's useful to have the nose up because to make it move forward, you push the nose down and the machine tries to correct that by moving forwards. So you trick it into moving. So have a look at this video. Now there's something odd about this machine. There's no visible battery. The deck is really slim and you just see the wheels. And I was trying to make it sort of cool and, you know, I didn't like that huge battery box on the top. So if you've ever wondered what's inside one of those Chinese duct tape batteries that come in mock carbon fiber duct tape and not like a brick, if you actually take all the duct tape off, you'll see it's made of millions of little lithium cells, sort of badly spot welded and glue gunned together. And if you can manage to dissect that out without shorting everything out and put them into the deck of the skateboard, you can make a skateboard with a lovely flat deck. Unfortunately, if you're heavy, you couldn't ride it because it would bend and snap in half and everything would explode. Um, so then I thought carbon fiber. Now, as we all know, if something's made in carbon fiber, it's just better isn't it? It's just for no reason, really. Um, don't cut carbon fiber with a grinding disc and a Dremel using a Dyson vacuum cleaner to hoover up the dust because your vacuum cleaner will make a sort of boof sound and then it will stop working forever, which is what happened. Luckily, it was an old one. Technical things on this, apart from the fact it's lovely carbon fiber, honeycomb, is it's now got a wee nunchuck as the steering system, uh, a wireless one at that, which Nintendo never made. They're um, a ripoff made by the Chinese. Um, there's a problem with that. If you use it in crowded spaces where lots of people are on mobile phones and things, it disconnects. So you pirouette down the road whilst trying to look as if that's what you meant to do all along. And this was at a street carnival in Cowley at the time. And so I learned the lesson from that. Go to a cable system. It's less exotic, but it's reliable. And with these things, reliable is what you need. Um, I did look at other ways of steering it. One was to use pressure sensors for your trailing foot. So you could go onto your toe or heel and the machine would steer. Um, I also saw this design concept someone had put up as a CAD, rendered CAD image of a rather nice design and tried to emulate it. You know, a really compact device, pneumatic tires. Pneumatic tires are good because they smooth out the bumps in normal tarmac. 
which you feel every one of if you've got polyurethane tires. And you could even run it upside down. So um, that worked. Um, I don't know why people do this. People put beautiful CAD images of things on the web all the time, but they never build any of them. Um, you know, if you're going to do it, build it. That's what I say, but then I'm not an engineer. So just to see if it could be done, I thought, well, I've got this skateboard wheel hanging around. Sorry, the um, go-kart tire. Could you build a one-wheeled Segway? So I built a one-wheeled Segway called The Thing after the film. And um, yeah, it kind of worked. It was really hard to ride, really slow, and didn't really offer any uh, advantage technically over any anything else. But it did improve. So here I am. At a Derby Maker Fair on the left, this is Nick Thatcher, who's the only other person in the UK with the same hobby on the right, on one of his early machines. And as you can see, it's, it's kind of getting there. It's reasonably controllable there. Um, it's good, good fun to ride. So if we go to our next slide. I was then, I kind of got, I work in a hospital, obviously, but I, I meet people that are disabled. A lot of disabled people, um, who don't obviously have spinal injuries, can actually walk a short way. People who use wheelchairs, powered wheelchairs, they can walk a short way, but they can't walk all the way around Asda. So um, they hate being in these devices. They hate being in powered wheelchairs. If you could build something that resembles a scooter of any sort, they would much prefer to ride them. So I thought, could you build something that's like a Segway, but it's based on something like a rally chopper? So. I built this thing. These are BMX wheels. It's got fluorescent yellow tires just, just because I could, and they were cheap on eBay. And um, it, it did work, and it got a lot of interest. And the idea was that your legs actually go on the outside of the wheels rather than on the inside. And in fact, you can buy all these kinds of things now from China, in fact. So again, another random event. I was approached by someone who's a bit of a mover and shaker in the London design world. His son is a teenager, and he has a uh, problem with his legs, and he needs a powered wheelchair, but he refuses to use one because they all look like horrible things your grandmother might use. They have lead-acid batteries in the bottom. They have the giant swivelly casters that take up a huge amount of room and shout disabled and bang into the door frames when you try and turn into the room. So he wanted something to designed that he would lead the team that not only works but would be cool because it's for a teenager it's got to look good and he specifically wanted a two-wheeled um, wheelchair powered and he's prepared to raise the money to design this so I said um, there is this game called Doom and it, there's a film of the game and it's really awful but it does have this character in it that's in a wheelchair and clearly the dimensions are wrong if you look at the width of his shoulders versus the width of the machine it's about five feet wide and it would never go through a door but he has some interesting design concepts one is the stalk that holds the control panel which means you can run all your wiring up and down and know that it's protected rather than having curly cables coming up to the seat and round on the arm and all that kind of thing. So I said to him, oh, all right, I'm a hobbyist. I'm sort of getting known in this area. I'll build you a concept demonstrator. and It'll have no safety features whatsoever, but it will be have a, look like a chair. It will self-balance and you control it with a joystick, not by leaning it forward and back. It's not got a T-handle. It's not a Segway with a seat bolted to it. It actually is controllable through a joystick. So uh, came up with this. Um, and if you look at the controls, bit of early 3D printing here. I've got a MakerBot, the old plywood one at this point. Um, there is a joystick that only moves forward and back. It's from a flight simulator controller. And it has a rocker switch a large one on the end. So forward and back is your direction. Steering is the rocker switch. The elbow rest was nicked from the Apollo Lunar Rover because they had the same problem I had with this. If you're bouncing around, you end up nudging the joystick forward and back all the time and you, the machine goes crazy. You have to lock your elbow somehow in place. They had exactly the same problem on the Lunar Rover. And so I got that from the Haynes manual on the Lunar Rover, which you can buy in any good shop. So here's Hopefully, just a quick run round of this machine. Um, it worked well enough to make this video, and it, it allowed him to raise his first 100 grand odd, which he needed to get it built. So it actually has rotor casters at the rear, so you can switch it off and park it without it just falling over. 
Um, but these retract into the fuselage at the back if you want to. So when you're in balancing mode, um, they act as your rear safety wheels, but they're actually airborne. And so they, they half retract, in fact. And if we just maybe jump through this a little, no, maybe not. Kids always ask you, how fast does it go, mate? And the answer is, it doesn't matter how fast it goes, it's can you control the thing? Um, so I'm just showing in this video, it can be controlled, and um, it did everything we wanted it to, um, and it helped him raise the money required to take it to the next step. This is another fun project. This is filmed at another Maker Fair. Can you build a Vespa scooter with only one wheel and paint it green and put a red star in it and make it look like some secret Russian technology from the Cold War? And this is panelled in Chinese electric scooter panels that have all been repurposed and repainted. Um, and it was just a fun machine. And I um, cannibalized it for parts, but actually I should have kept it because it's actually a good laugh. I mean, that's the thing with these machines. They're actually really good fun to ride. And this is why I'm moving towards one-wheeled motorbike type devices because they are the most fun. I started with skateboards simply because if it went berserk, you could jump off. Um, nothing more than that. So, was on telly, entered the Hackaday Prize in 2014. I can't even remember what the spec was, but we managed to shoehorn a one wheel motorbike into the spec. And um, we came up with this, and it's got fairing on it from a real motorbike um, twin wheels, chain drive, 500 watt motor, brushed motor, and it worked. But it was incredibly dangerous because if you wanted to jump off it, your legs will get tangled up in all this fairing and it would cut the inside of your legs quite badly, which happened a couple of times. You steered it by leaning left and right, which can be done if you're a circus performer, but it's actually quite difficult. So uh, it went, but it was very dangerous. We managed to get a few film shots. It was f um, featured on Discovery Channel in America, Daily Planet, it's an American program. And uh, that was my first effort at a proper motorbike. So things to learn, no sharp pointy bits, keep it really slim, the fuselage. Uh, watch this video closely. Watch it, watch it, watch it. Oh! Yeah, oh! Right, so, safety skid. Those of you old enough to remember Jerry Anderson's UFO series set in the future, 1981, the aliens were invading the Earth. And what happened was we shot them down with these great interceptors and they didn't have wheels, they had ski, skids, skis. So I thought, well, I could put a wheel out at the front in the air, but it would look really stupid. Or I could have a cool sort of skid thing. So that's what I did. But you'll see in the video, when I'm testing the skid, it just grips the tarmac quite well, actually, and it would actually flip you over. So that was no good. So it just shows you have to test things and build them, not just design them on computers. Um, so there's actually some little tiny wheels embedded in the skid, in fact, in the actual uh, production version, with a nice big shock absorber, chromed of course, because chrome is good as well as carbon fiber. So, this is just a short clip. This is on Pendine Sands in South Wales. I live in Swansea, about 40 minutes from Pendine Sands. Enormous beach, lovely and flat. Um, and we've got a machine that's now kind of working. Uh, the wheel is not from an aircraft. People say, oh, is that a landing wheel from an aircraft? No. I rang up this guy who runs one of the biggest UK tyre suppliers, and I said, I want a spherical tyre like on a Dyson ball barrow that's not made anymore. And he said, well, you can't get one, but you need a kite buggy tyre. So that's a kite buggy tyre, which is a three-wheeled device pulled along a beach by a kite, and it skims, it planes on the sand. So that's fab. Big fat tire, safety skid. The one on the left here actually retracts um, with a, li a linear actuator. And the reason for that is it looks cool because obviously when it's retracted, it doesn't function anymore as a skid in any engineering sense. It just looks cool. So it's up to you whether you want more danger in your life or not. You can retract it if you want. It obviously has a Mac meter because if you bought a Mac meter on eBay, you need to use it for something. So that actually shows you the motor power from 0 to 100%. You must never get to 100% with a self-balancer, otherwise you'll just fall off the front. It can't go any faster. Um, I'll talk about Pendine Sands in a second. This is Sir Malcolm Campbell, 1929 Bluebird, deliberately driving through the water to cool the tires down before his return run um, at 150 odd miles an hour. 
Uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. So we got a concept that works, it steered, it stopped, it had some safety features, so now is the time to really go for it. Let's stop messing around with a 500 watt motor, let's put a 3000 watt hub motor in, yeah, imported from China, um, came with home office tape all over it because they thought I was importing drugs, obviously, um, and it's built into an alloy wheel, wide alloy wheel, so I can put a wideish tire on it. The power controller was a problem. Um, you can't get high current uh, brushless motor controllers easily. Um, and I ended up using one from Robotech. And you kind of get what you pay for. They're not cheap, but it works. And you can control it via a serial link from an Arduino. I've moved on now. I'm using Arduino boards, by the way. But the other thing I bought was the headlamp pod from a Ural motorcycle. They're made in Russia since the war, and they're still made, and they're much cheaper than Hardy Davidson ones, and they're huge. You can cram electronics goodies into them, uh, way in excess of just a light bulb at the front. So, next thing, battery pack. Need a damn great big battery pack for this. So it's going to have a cylindrical fuselage, so we need a cylindrical battery pack. So this is CNC machined plastic um, battery holder. These are headway cells. There's 20 odd of them. Um, a man battery management system, and there's a giant contactor, which is just like a giant relay to turn everything on and off at the front. And this slides into the fuselage from the front. So we've got all the main parts built. That obviously took ages to build. And this is what we built, which we actually brought this morning um, and played around with. This top right one is the first one. You see, it's, I had to give in and get rid of the skid and put a safety wheel there from Machine Mart fluorescent yellow. Um, it looks awful. It doesn't even work because I've mounted it too high up. By the time that hit the ground, you'd be going over the handlebars again. So the biggest design challenge of this, believe it or not, was how to make the safety wheel at the front look even vaguely okay. And um, there's a website called Deviant Art where artists, CGI artists, put their work up. A lot of it's science fiction. So we have this contraption here, which obviously has a machine gun, because all good motorbikes have machine guns on them. But it does have this structure at the front, which could be adapted to hide a wheel, perhaps. So by putting a lamp on the front of it to make it look like it's a light, it distracts you from the fact that actually there's a wheel in it. And that's the safety wheel. And it does actually work. Um, this is a quick video with some audio. It goes through the controls, which I've had to skip not a over. Lever. It's a dead man lever. If I let go because of the this, dead man is uh, a lever now. It's not a lever. It talks to you. So it has no displays. You can't see the displays integral, while you're riding this thing. You're too busy trying not to die. So it talks to you. And it uses an 80s and retro voice, which you can just download can off the web to run on an Arduino. Really okay, cheap. ready, level off. It won't come on until we bring it level, otherwise it will fly backwards. So, so listen now. Here we go. Autopilot start. Stabilize. American accent. The balance the point. Excellent. If I change this, you'll it see now it changes. It's telling me the, the speed the in percentage, no uh, motor power in percentage. So it's saying 1%. No percent. You'll hear it. That's what it's doing. You see, there you can adjust the balance point. There's potentiometers for everything in the code. And the twist grip is used to adjust the balance point forward or back while you're riding it. So that's how you speed up or slow down. To go faster, I would do that. And we also have an emergency brake. That's the emergency brake lever. Press this. If you watch it will the just angle lean the back, 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 and then eventually you'll slide off lean the tail back, onto your feet, back, which is much more elegant than smashing your face in, which is what happened earlier. There's also a steering left. system. People nice think it shifts your weight to the right or left, the left but it doesn't. It actually moves the wheel onto the left or right edge of the tire. So I'll skip this, but I'll just leave you with this clip. This is Pendine Sands. It's a very odd place to ride on Pendine Sands. You feel the history sort of coming out of the sand of greater people than you um, riding on this thing. And it's miles and miles of perfectly flat beach and actually very fortunate to live close to it. And um, this is Nick, who you saw earlier riding the machine, or not, as the case may be. But you can see it goes along, it's controllable, it does everything you want. I'm over time, so I'll stop there. 
but I'll just leave you with the last slide. Um, Nick went to university and he designed this as his final year project. So he's, as I said, he's the only other person in the country with this hobby. And so the next project he might do is, is to get this working. So you may even say this, see this at a future meeting or a future um, make affair, hopefully. Um, but uh, there you go. It's a fascinating hobby. Thank you very much. I think we have just enough time for one or two questions. Anyone? Aha. Do you actually draw, can you actually ride a normal unicycle? Can you actually ride a unicycle, a normal no. pedal powered one? No, I, I'm, no, I'm pretty useless at riding a normal one. I keep thinking it's really all bad, I should learn to ride a normal unicycle. It's on my bucket list of things to do actually, yeah. Okay, uh, I have one quick question. Do you have any plans for uh, applying for road legality? Um, it, it's interesting, in, in the UK, you cannot ride a self-balance, a Segway on the pavement. You can only ride it on private land with the landowner's permission. Um, however, the wheelchair project is interesting. If you look at the rules for powered wheelchairs and mobility scooters, it doesn't say how many wheels you must have. It just has a maximum weight of t about 250 kilos, which is very heavy. Um, and, and lighting things and uh, rules such as uh, the, it must have reasonable directional control. It must have a parking brake. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they're the rules for mobility scooters. So actually you could build a two wheel wheelchair type device and not be in breach of the law technically. That's just about. Okay. So watch that space. <laughs> Thank you. That was uh, astonishingly cool. Uh, Thank you again.